everybody? Morning. How's everybody doing? Uh, All right, so, so I'm just going to throw this out there right now. This session is going to be an interactive session, which means even though we have a, a, a handsome panel that's in front of you. <laughs> Where? Where? <laughs> yeah. Well, we, we definitely want this to be an interactive conversation. Uh, this is definitely, we consider it to be a very hot topic as we start to think about how do we build our IT teams. So we're going to be talking about how do we build diverse IT teams. And we're not just going to be talking about it from uh, a social background perspective or an ethnic perspective, but really, how do we build a diverse team with all the skill sets and all of the different talents um, that we need to make our IT departments full and fruitful. So that's kind of the discussion that we're going to have this morning. We're very excited to be on this wonderful panel today. I get the pleasure of moderating this panel. I'm Maurice Furrow from the UNC School of Government. And to my left, your right, I have two of the best CIOs in the state of North Carolina, uh, Dwayne Campbell from the city of Fayetteville. <laughs> and, and Mike Taylor from Pitt County. So we're excited to have these guys on our panel. So we're going to actually start out with just having them talk a little bit about their environments, and then we're going to get into some questions. If at any time you have a question from the audience, please just raise your hand and we'll, we'll get to We really want this to be a very fruitful, interactive conversation. I can't highlight that enough. Okay? So at this time, we'll turn it over to Dwayne and Mike to kind of talk through their environments. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. So Maurice said turn to talk about our environment. Well, as most people know, Fayetteville is known pretty much for housing Fort Bragg or military territory. You know? So for us, leading uh, a diversity is pretty much uh, a necessity. We don't really have an option to, to not have a diverse team in order to meet the needs of the citizens because I think at the end of the day, the reason why this is a hot topic is because our citizens and the people that we support are demanding it. It was just left up to us from a technology perspective. This may not necessarily come up on our radar, but it comes up, it's coming up on our radar because it's important to the uh, people that we support, our council, our uh, commissioners, and people of that nature. And if you do not have a diverse, in my opinion, if you do not have uh, a diverse workforce, how can you truly say that you're meeting the needs of the citizens? Because you're thinking at uh, in, a, in a very uh, homogeneous type perspective, and you're really not moving into what I would consider uh, uh, a multifaceted or looking at the issues that are coming before city, uh, cities and that they are encountering, problems that they are encountering. If you, if you have a very uh, homogeneous perspective on uh, or, or answers, if you will, to those multifaceted problems, then are you really going to be, meet the needs of the citizens? So I think this is one of those things where, those issues, I should say, where uh, I'm glad to see that technology uh, is, is jumping out, or the power area is kind of jumping out to the forefront of it, because that's really not what you would hear. Even five, ten years ago, we didn't talk about those soft skills. Now we talk a lot about change management and, and, and citizen engagement, and I think those topics are the reason behind while we are even having this conversation, and actually why you all even thought to, to, to come in here today and say, hey, you know, of all the other topics that you can go see, vendors and so forth, that you thought it important to, to even come to this session. So part of what I would like to get out of this conversation is uh, why did you feel it was important to spend your time coming to this particular session, and how did you plan to use the data or the information that you uh, gathered from us and from your peers sitting beside you, how do you plan to use that information to go back and, and, and change your environment and that changes it for your environment. So I'm really looking forward to that. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. I would um, add to, to what Dwayne was sharing. And, I, and I'm glad um, Maurice clarified um, before starting off that um, diversity is more than just social, um, ethnic background. It, it, it truly is a, a full um, array of skills and personalities. And that is something, um, when I came into to my role, current role, um, it was not the most diverse uh, group. 
And I started out by, and instead of focusing on the people aspect, um, I focused on back to the technology. We were a traditional shop of this is the square box, and this is how we do it, and we provide that service the same to everybody. You just got however much of that square that um, you needed to do your job. So um, I try to encourage um, different ideas and thoughts and started with that. And when you do that, I think that encourages the diversity in an indirect manner um, without having to try to focus first on the diversity of people. I think it kind of starts with that feeling. I would also add that um, diversity, um, creating a diverse team is um, both easy and difficult. Uh, sometimes it happens uh, just by itself. Uh, you get the synergies and inertia from those um, uh, different uh, team members. But then it's, it's a constant focus too because you can have a great, uh, greatly diverse team with skills, personalities, and even the, the other uh, socioethnic background. But then as people um, mature and leave, um, you have to rebalance. So it's, it's not something that you do one time check it off with us and, and go on. So that's what I'll do. If I can echo one thing that, that Mike, brought to, Mike brought up that, that, that caused a thought, um, was centered around, it's not a, a one and done, because you can you can be very intentional about setting up and, and, and having a diverse workforce from, if you look at just women in IT, if you will. I think when you start looking at some of the softer skills, you want to just do that better than, than most men. And obviously you can't generalize, but I think, in, in my opinion, women just do that better. But if it's just a one and done, and you don't, and, and as a leader of the organization, you don't change, what happens is that new thinking becomes the same old thing. So what happens, if you don't encourage diversity of thought, then the people around you, you get your approval, you begin to think like you. And you have to shake that up. So you got, as a leader of the organization, you have to be very intentional about creating an environment where it is safe to have new thinking, if you will. Uh, uh, and, 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 and if it fails, you know, you know what? Fail fast and let's figure out what we did wrong and move and move forward, but not create that environment where you, you challenge the new thinking or the, the old card, if you will. It didn't work out and now we're never going to do anything that is even progressive, even you know, remotely progressive again because this didn't work out. So I think you have to be very intentional about falling into that trap as well. Very good comments, open comments. Uh, what, I, what I was hearing um, from, from both of you is that um, diversity is, is something that is definitely needed in the IT departments. Um, it's something that you both embrace. What do you do when your organization as a whole, the organization and culture as a whole, doesn't necessarily embrace diversity? So how do you, as the IT leader, kind of spur this change, if you will, in a mindset of the organization? I'm not sure that was one of my papers. <laughs> it wasn't. <laughs> and, and see, Dwayne, <laughs> Quickly, diversity. <laughs> no, 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 no. I'll be the first of my questions here. Um, that in, can be, again, easy and difficult. I think it's the, uh, the topic that you're trying to be diverse on. If it's a, if it's a direction uh, for the organization, then I think it gets back to um, what Dwayne was just saying about you have to model it. So I think you have to, through your department, and the way you conduct your service and um, interactions with others. To me, that's how you demonstrate it and trying to get others to come on board versus trying to um, push it, you model it um, to the organization is how I would, I would say that. And, and this is very similar to creating a crafting business case for a project that you want to move forward and that you're helping one of your departments craft. Uh, you know, what is the return on investment? So if you're looking at uh, council members or your senior leadership team, think people of that nature, there again, if they see the business benefit, uh, they see it working, they're going to jump on board. They're smart enough to jump on board. So uh, as Mike said, uh, 
the, the proof is in the pudding, so to speak. So you have you may want to start small and say, hey, this is what we are doing. Here's the benefit based on this team or based on these group of factors or set of factors or this new thinking. You know that opens up the gate. For instance, uh, uh, I just had another thought. I saw, and all my the team that's here know I'm kind of ABD in that regard. So I can see somebody <laughs> and it's like it creates this thought process. But one of the things that I did when I um, went to the city uh, of Bevel as a CIO, I didn't really focus on the technical aspects of my first my first year. I actually achieved it that really. Uh, there was obviously there are technical things that we have to do as far as shoring up some things, absolutely. But a lot of what I focused on was those um, those soft skills and really being that business uh, advisor, strategic business advisor to our customers so that they can see that. So that basically all I wanted was that I wanted to see at the table. I just wanted to be a part of the conversation. And I know that I, once I can be part of the conversation, then I can show you the, uh, the benefit of, of, of technology. But one of the things that we did uh, uh, from, a, from a soft skill standpoint, we created uh, your area, the area that Chris McMillan is moving for, Six Sigma. So I actually had everyone in our, not everyone, but quite a few people in our organization. I think we had about 20 people at the first starting out in our organization who went through a Six Sigma program. But more importantly, we had, I think it was nine, they had nine to 11 directors who were in the Six Sigma program as well. So they began to model that behavior in the departments. So just something like that, where you can just get a small, make a small step in, in talking about you know diversity of thought, or, or in my particular case, approaching technology in a different way, things of that nature, and then you begin to build on to that. And next thing you know, so they see that oh, okay, this this is how this is adding value to the organization, and then you just continue to to, to build on to that. So it's interesting. Um, one of the things that we were actually doing at the School of Government is that we actually have um, put together a diversity committee. How many, how many of you have had organizations that have put together diversity committees? Right. And typically what that entails is that there's some sort of training that's done once a year and then kind of say that we check the box off and we move on to a, to a different topic. Uh, we, at the school we've been very intentional about making sure that we are looking at a multitude of diversities within our workplace. One so, one so that kind of really like hit home for me one day, we were, we were actually talking about a, um, a software company and all of their, their programmers were right-handed. And so one of the guys that they were interviewing says, well, I'm left-handed, and so when you do whatever you're gonna do with this program, it didn't necessarily work well for left-handers than it did for right-handers. So it really like, oh wow. So, so I said all of that to get to this question. How are you guys going about building diverse teams and, and how are you, what are the things you're thinking about when you think about diversity? I know we kind of hit on some of the different things, but what specifically, or are there specifics that you're thinking about when it comes to diversity? Because I never would have thought a diverse team meant how many right-handed people versus I have versus left-handed people. So are you encountering those types of issues as you're thinking about diversity within your team, even from a programming perspective or networking perspective or just IT perspective as a, as a whole? Once again, that's not on the sheet either. <laughs> <laughs> uh, one of the things that I think that I look for more aside from anything else, whether it's in the networking arena, the uh, applications arena, uh, our customer relationship management area. And, um, I'm looking for people that think, okay, first and foremost, the ability to think, because one of the things that in this area, as you all know, you need to be agile. As Mike so eloquently put it, you know, when he first in the county, he said, hey, you just got this slice of the pie. But now he's saying, okay, the pot doesn't always have to be round. So uh, you, need to be, have agile, you need to be agile. So I'm looking for people who think. I also look for, uh, when I look at the resumes, I look for people who didn't necessarily grow up in the technology world. Just, you know, went to school and MIS degree, you know, and went working at a 
software firm. Da, 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 da. One of my best early on, and Marcus can tell you, one of my uh, Tracy can tell us one of the best. One of, what I found one of, the, one of my best technicians on the help desk. He's now on the networking side. Uh, his background was in plumbing. He was a plumber, and he has a passion for technology. So he began to teach himself some things. And but he was telling me one time we had some conversations. He was like the same. Uh, troubleshooting things that I did when I go to somebody's house to look at a plumbing leak is the same thing that I look for. I mean, not the same thing, but you know, kind of that thought process. Um, uh, I just hired a lady for our, one of our CRM roles. Her back, she was with IBM for several years, but uh, her background was, uh, I mean, her most recent job, I should say, was at DSS in HR. So you're like, hmm, how does that translate? You know, so I look for, for people who didn't necessarily grow up in the IT world. Now, is that a little bit more difficult when you begin to look at some of those uh, uh, more technical skills like networking and, and so forth? But our, uh, I don't know if it's in here or not, but uh, one, of the, one, of, one of my better employees, um, uh, John, he, he uh, worked at Park and Rec. So now when he uh, creates Programming, uh, uh, you know, develop programs, and so working with our website team has a practical perspective because he was out in the field and he knows now how this is going to be used. So one of the things that he's working on is um, our uh, adopt street program and things of that nature. So he has a different perspective than someone else because he's lived it, he's worked in that environment. So I look for those individual individuals who come from diverse backgrounds, not just grew up in the tech, you know, not just grew up in the technical area all your life. So that's one of the things that I look for that has not um, failed me. Is that, and, he, and, he, and if it's not a job, then maybe a hobby. So that's one of the things I always look for is uh, what kind of hobbies do you have? Because that's going to help you form and shape your perspective as well. So those are the two of the things that I look for when I'm looking for the resumes and things of that nature. What other uh, jobs that you have outside of IT? And then what hobbies do you have? You say, hey, I go home and read technical magazines, and uh, grew up in the night, and I, and, you know, it doesn't necessarily mean you're not a uh, great employee, um, uh, but I really begin to look at, you know, how, what, what your perspective, your perspective is so much limited. So that's what I'm talking about. So adding on to that, um, it's kind of interesting, you, you talked about the different background versus um, being a pure um, computer science or IT degree. I had this conversation with Enterprise Applications Directors here, and we kind of joke that um, it appears that many times some of your best employees are musicians or artists or have some other kind of more creative, what one would consider a creative background. So we also kind of focus on that blend of, um, you know, are you very analytical and structured? Uh, are you creative and fluid? Um, also looking at the uh, complements of your team that you currently have. Um, you know, if you have a, a team full of introverts, it's going to make it very difficult um, to do anything. Nor do you want a team full of extroverts, you know, but then you're just uh, being, you know, constant uh, head headbutting and, and things like that. So it's really a, a blend of uh, what the needs are for the organization, what your current team membership is, and then uh, again, as you mentioned, looking at uh, not just saying I have to have this degree or this certification, because many times. Um, that is not exactly what you need. Are there any questions from the audience? Any thoughts from the audience? Yes, I'm just curious how large your organizations are. From my perspective, when you're talking about diversity, you have a very large IT shop. It makes a huge difference compared to a two person or a three person or a five person IT shop. Because, you know, I mean, like I said, if you've got 25 people report to you, that's a lot of different personalities, and there's a lot of, uh, I guess, get and take between the different personalities you do. When you're limited only, you know, filling three positions, you got to be very selective in those three, and they got to get along with each other. I mean, you've got the skill sets from the IT standpoint, but you also got those personalities that have to work together because there's not enough people to back each other up to do a ton of cross training. I'm just curious about that's how big those are. That's an excellent question. Because it does, it, it would shape that. I, I can definitely see that. Uh, I'm, I think we're right at 30 in my shop. Um, but you know, as 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 the so are you the director? Okay. 
So one of the questions that and and and, you, and, and that because it's a it's that your decision, the effects of that decision is going to be multiple. <laughs> Whereas you know I could maybe hire that person for a couple of months and train them. Like, oh, okay. So I can so I you know, take what I'm about to say you know, with the grain of salt, considering the fact that you know you like you said if you're in a smaller shop. But I would ask you though to to, to ask yourself what is the um, like how comfortable with you are you, I should say, with somebody that's different? Are you willing to grow in a different way? Um, uh, you know, it's so, uh, one of the things, the only thing that I tell my guys that I cannot, that's like a, that's off the table that I cannot deal with is someone who's not customer focused. Any other personality, I can, I can, kind of, I can kind of deal with it. But if you're not a customer focused and you know, you're, Every time you see the customer, it's like, oh my God, and I don't deal well with that personality. But other than that, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty good. Uh, and some of the people that approach things in a manner that I, I wouldn't, I've learned the most from. So uh, uh, I would ask myself, how comfortable with you are you, I should say, with, with being challenged? Where they're not, they're not necessarily compliment you, like, this is the kind of person that I would, I would, you know, maybe the, the person that you would have a beer with and the person that you want to work with may not necessarily be the same. You know, you may get a lot more work out of someone uh, or much more effective work, you know, out of someone in efficient as well, someone that has a different thought process. And now there again, that's a huge risk when you may not get a position or you get a position and you're like, really? I, I gotta make you know this is life or death kind of thing you're probably looking at because those positions don't come around like, and you feel like you really need to make the best as well. You really need that, that the decision that you make is, 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 is very critical. And I think even in larger shops, that's the same thing. We, you know, we don't get a lot of positions, so when you get a position, you really want it to work out. Uh, but I do think that we have to take that risk sometimes, and, and, and even in the smaller shops, and say, hey, you know what? I'm, I'm not. This person is just quirky enough, you know. You may not necessarily say they're different. Use some other term because if you say they're different, then that, from a, from a mental standpoint, that gives you an out. You say, oh, man, it's not working. But if you say something like quirky, quirky can be good, you know. It's just quirky enough that they just might work. You know, I don't want people to look at. I consider myself an introvert. Uh, somebody, my team says, no, you're not. Right? But I consider myself. You know, but but I think you really want to begin to look at those people who, you know, like I said, extroverts, introverts, but also just a different type of thinking than than you. And 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 it may not necessarily work out all the time, but we find people who we felt complimented us very well and it didn't work out either because something else that they did during the interview that we just didn't that just didn't come out. So I think I think you have to ask yourself, how risk tolerant what's your risk tolerance? Or working with someone who doesn't necessarily think like you or approach you no know, problems like you. Now, as directors, or as leaders in our respective organizations, we all have those things that are just like off. We just say, okay, this is like undiscussable, if you will. We all have those things. Uh, uh, but, but for the most part, I try to use that term quirky. Is this something about this person? Is this quirky enough that this just might work? I'm not, I'm not necessarily comfortable with them, but I'm comfortable enough with my ability to be able to work with them to help them in the best way. I hope that answers you. So, <clears throat> understanding that the subject is how to build a diverse team, so I'm speaking about the front end, I just wanted to ask um, if you could speak to the back end in terms of how you measure success. Um, so, specifically, do you do your um, diversity plans or teams have have any involvement in lessons learned after after all projects in your organization, uh, inclusive of those outside of IT? And I would say um, internally, we um, we do have uh, a process that we go through. Uh, back to the organization, I would say we're not that mature and being our intentional with diversity there. Um, on the back side of, of what you're talking about with 
the success of the project. We, we do try to assess um, how creative, um, what did we learn. Uh, I, I encourage people to, to speak up and if they're, um, and this may be an indirect way of answering your question too, if, if there's not discussion, then we probably are not going to have a, 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 the best outcome that we could. Uh, then there's a point to where Dwayne was saying, then you just get to a point, you say, okay, we've had the discussion, and then sometimes you have to step in and say, this is what we're going to do. Um, and, and we do learn from that, and what I try to do, um, and about the same size as, as Dwayne's shop, is have the interaction between the different uh, teams, work groups that are focused. And that creates, I think, the uh, diversity. And so we get back, um, not only if one service area has the primary responsibility for that project, I strongly encourage that they're not the only ones. We either succeed together or we fail together. Um, and that doesn't always come through on the team. And I think that's how we measure the success if everyone has ownership of it. Um, and if it's, it's sometimes we don't, then we kind of come back in and, and discuss um, why others were not pulling or in, uh, providing what was required to make that a success. Because as you well know, in, you know <laughs> diversity is not the panacea. We're, this, we're just talking about diversity here. So this is just one aspect of why things work and don't work. Uh, so since we're focusing on diversity, we're, we are you know, shaping our conversation obviously around that, but we know there are other factors as to why things work groups may projects may fail, work groups may not work together, depends on other factors as well. But uh, one of the things from a, from a, a back end process that I do, and it's not formal, but when at the end of a project or some initiative, one of the things I look for when I'm talking to the director to see how things are going, or I'm talking to the lead person in that operational area. If, if something is not working right, or if something is working well, who do they communicate? Like if something is going well, and I have a PM, uh, we just get City Works implementation, and uh, one of my guys, uh, Joe, Joe Gutterelli, he he's the PM on that particular project. And these guys have, you know, if something is going well, they'll copy the director, he'll copy the city manager, and definitely the, the deputy city manager is on it. Hey, you know, Dwayne, you got to do this, 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 and this. Now, if something's not going well, he sometimes don't even want to tell me. You know, <laughs> so they will, they, they kind of protect him. So he's in my shop, but he's looked at as one of them. So he, he's made that transition to where throughout this project, they, are, they have adopted him into their process, so they began to they began to uh, protect him. And it's kind of like that, you know, you see that a lot in public safety. You know, you get that where they protect their own. Now, they don't blast you, they come at you, but they protect their own. So that's just one of the things that I found work for me. It's nothing formal. It's just kind of a, a, a question that I'll ask, and then I'll look for certain behaviors, and I know that, okay, then, this person has made that transition to where they they truly have been uh, adopted, if you will, by by that that organization. Um, is that strictly based on you know the diverse background of that person? It could be, or it could just be that person's a good PM. I mean, there's just different factors, but that's just one of the things I look for from a, a measurement standpoint. I don't I don't I have to go back and look if there's anything formal in our active action plan that speaks to that. I, I, that's a good question. I have to go back and look at that. And, and if not, maybe craft something that in our active action plan that, that, that speaks to that. Any other questions from the audience? Or comments? I was saying, you know, that informal, that you're talking about, I actually have a lot of formal that you can try to track stuff like that. But I know my job, we're, we're less than 10, and I've got former Marines, uh, in the military, I've got operations guys that we try an IT talent with at Maverick and IT. Married, single, female, male, kids, no kids. And I hear them cutting up and laughing when they walk by the office and I see them working together teams and I hear about going to get beers as uninitiated. I'm not setting these things up. They're doing it all after work meeting now. That to me is a huge 
I mean, if you know if you know they're diverse already, then you, again, you know your staff. But the fact that they're hanging out after work, if they're supporting one another during working hours, covering for each other, helping each other out in situations, that to me is the team you want to build and you want to work with, and it makes it fun to work with. And, and when you got your staff, you know, that's something that can be fast. That's what you're going to be I think that's very key is trying to create a, a fun work environment. That, in my opinion, all this other stuff that you intentionally try to do will indirectly just um, reap rewards. And so I, I, I encourage that at all times. In fact, um, we used to, um, between our different service areas, we started a, each quarter, we would let that kind of was a combination of project planning and execution and building teamwork. But that service area would plan an event, we would all come together and then kind of rotate. And we had some of the best um, ideas, concepts, and team building from that. Of course, you can't, all um, things don't work forever. So it had a season and it worked. Um, and you actually have to remember those things and we'll bring that back. So I think that's a, a very good point. I would also add to your um, small organization shop for diversity. Um, it's interesting, there was a conversation right before this and the customer service focus that you talked was kind of like a, a dominant trait you want to look for. But the other thing too, that, that you do have to have a cohesive team. So the question um, diversity might be something as simple as you know, like the uh, Miller Lite used to be, uh, tastes great, less filling, but we still enjoy drinking beer. Right. Uh, but we have different perspectives on it, so. Um, just all that. <laughs> <laughs> so, Chris, I want to ask you about all the positives. So let's, let's, how do we make this as real as possible? Let's, let's go to a deeper level. Yes. Like, has anyone ever been ostracized for the, you know, the way they look? You know, I mean, obviously they're, they're an easy one. You can say, you know, your, your face or something like that, but the women in the group, have you ever been ostracized or, or looked at uh, like, oh, you know, you're a female, what do you know about technology? Or you have, you know, you don't have, you have hair, so obviously you can't say you know anything about technology. I mean, whatever, you know, you, know, you got to be bald-headed, you know, they know something about technology. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Um, I mean, so I'm just asking, you know, who's been ostracized or felt, uh, Make, someone make them feel uh, less than because of uh, uh, some factor other than their their skill set. Anyone? Okay. Um, uh, Sam, yeah, I saw your hand, and then the, the, the lady in the bit. Orange. Okay. Front orange. orange. Volunteer paint. <laughs> All right. Having been in the backyard for quite a while, 38 years, 38 years ago, being an African. to me, but I think it's also been a benefit to me as well, because it may be determined, well, if I'm going to be ostracized for being the only African-American female in this arena, I guess I better run real fast to keep up. Okay, okay, so that was your token. Okay, that's, 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 so did you find yourself from an assimilation standpoint doing things that you felt uh, when, you, when you went home, like, oh, I don't like that. I, you know, I did that to get along, but I don't like how that made uh, Well, yeah, I mean, accommodating and, and changing somewhat who and what I was, and that was from everything to hair and other things. Mm -hmm. Because in corporate, I mean, in that right. arena, 30 some odd years ago, they followed the same model that IBM followed, because they made it through suit, a sure. certain look, you right. had to have on holes, and things that aren't required now were part of this. Uh, expectation back in that day. So yeah, there were things I had to do. I mean, I had to wear my hair a certain way. I didn't like that, but it was a part of being in that arena. Okay. And the, the lady with the front.
So what? So one of those was internal. Well, you talked about the external factor. Uh, what was the internal? Meaning that coach things have changed. We've progressed the way now. You're that's we're looking for that new young talent in your because we see the benefit and, and that new thinking and obviously the return on investment has been there. That's why that has been adopted. But from an internal standpoint, what what was the new thinking that you adopted that that caused you to say, okay, I'm probably more skilled than this person, I have more education, more certifications, but they still, I, st they still, I still gave them, as I think we give people power, I still gave them the power to make me feel less than. So at some point, you had to have a mental, uh, you, know, you went through this mental gymnastics, if you will, to where you had to change your thinking. What was that? What was that like? Let's talk through that because that's what I think is what will help us move forward. Yeah. Personally, the opportunity opened up within the organization that I didn't actually become a leader. Um, and that was the thing that I was Set those to the side, 
and then you start setting up interviews, and then you start looking at those personality traits to see what's going to fit best within your organization. You've done all that you can do to create the best workforce for your organization and the most diverse workforce for your organization as possible. If anybody challenges you at that point, you're just going back and pull what you have. This is the applicant pool that I had to select from. This is where I made my selection based on the credentials and expertise. These are the ones that I vetted out in the interview. And here, based on my reference checks, are the reason why I didn't select these and why I selected each other. I don't know what more you can do than that. Well, I, with that, what I would, uh, what I would suggest, if you will, is the criteria that you set up. Make sure that you have diversity of thought in that criteria, because if you set up the criteria based on your perspective or people that look like you or have the same thought process as you, then yeah, you are going to get a certain pool of people that's going to fit right here, because. You, you count with the criteria, you see what I'm saying? So I think it starts there. You need to make sure that, like one of the things that we do is we have uh, an assessment. We do like assessment pools, if you will, but we also make sure we have people from the operational areas uh, in there, and then we also make sure that from an HR question perspective that, we, that they, they pass that test so that we don't begin to set up a criteria where it's set up to where I'm going to get this type of person and that type of person only. So that's the only thing, I'm not, I mean, to your point, I agree with you, uh, that's the only thing I would caution you on is make sure that, that you get input in setting up that criteria when you're actually picking that person, but if not, it can move into the two point. I know we're sitting here talking about building diversity in our team, but I think diversity should span the entire organization. Because when it spans the entire organization, then it takes the focus off of one central department. So even if an outside organization does start to look at you, then they have to take in the entire organization as a whole. And when it's across the entire organization, then, then you can better plan for that. And it's not like so it's not real about you want. So I know one of, one of the things that um, one of the university committee at the school of government, and one of the things that we were talking about are our hiring practices and how we write up the actual job application, where do we post the job applications at, so all of those things have surfaced as uh, points of improvement that we could actually, you know, maybe build a better diverse team. Because if you've been to the School of Government, we're, we're not that diverse. As, as, a, as a faculty group, we're, we're just not that diverse. So we really are trying to have an emphasis on how, to we, how do we better uh, represent our state, how can we best serve our clients, and that sort of thing. So we're really trying to make sure that we have diverse mindsets. And, and we actually are having discussions like this in the room. So that, that's been a challenge, but I think we have leadership that is willing to go the distance, if you know what I'm saying, they're, they're not just going to stop at just checking the box. Well, then how much of that is, you know, when we talk about the new application out there, a lot of that's governed by HR. The yes. format that they have, the description itself, the classification of the job. So Absolutely. when you're living, because I know you see them on the listserv, we have more data from Fayetteville to Charlotte, South Carolina, and Florida, that's very similar in nature, I think. Yep. And it's where you're posting them. And again, a lot of that's governed by HR. You can certainly put them out on this server, but they got their top four or five and one security commission, newspapers, monster. They, you know, they go down and check off this list of where they're going to put them out at. Absolutely. And it's up to you to stick them on their alternative list server. And once you've done that, you've done everything that you can do to get the word out. And then, again, to me, I'm taking a question of what's qualified that candidate out. So they're doing the interview process, and that's where. That's where the diversity and the personal uh, personality traits and all the things you're looking for in that employee and how they can fit the I mean, your team and relations up there. So, you know, I'm interested in when y'all talk about that in the school of government, how much as IT managers can we control versus that we allow the HR, so HR to have a discussion? <laughs> yeah, so, so, our, so our HR department is, I'm uh, coming to you, our HR department is very involved with the discussion and uh, they have actually expanded their list of places that we actually submit job 
No, I'm not sure that now. But I agree wholeheartedly. You have to have HR and has to be a part of that discussion. And if really, from a diversity perspective, HR gets to be definitely at the table to have these, these kinds of discussions. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I would echo that. And I would say as a whole, because I know we struggle with this, government is very rigid. Yes. <laughs> and it makes it difficult to, when you try to be creative, you get a lot of pushback. So that, that in and of itself, our, our organizations are, all, we, we, we're our own worst enemy mm -hmm. yes. in trying to accomplish this. Because it is very structured and rigid and you, you can't do that. Um, so I, I just wanted to echo that. I think that's very strong. I wanted to follow up on the board's discussion about, you know, setting up the applicants. You know, the, the initial process goes through HR. We get the applicants and we say, okay, skill set, yes, no, possibly. We have pretty structured guidelines around our interview, what questions we can ask, those types of things. Do you guys do the HR-related interview, document all that, and then do you do a separate kind of IT-related interview? skills or is it all based on the, the diversity questions and the, the soft skills if you like? Do you do, you do any rating for the interview process on the technical side? Because we're very limited. We're pretty much dictated by HR saying, here you go, these are the group of questions you can pull from. We have our, we have, how do you say that? questions that everyone has, if you will. But one of the things that we uh, encourage, and that we, depending on the, uh, the job, we have different questions, technical questions, that we can ask. It's not, we're not limited to them, two, three, five, whatever, um, to, to, to just, you know, vet that particular individual. So that's one of the things that, that we, that I'm, I'm, you know, I encourage is making sure that Okay, you have these general questions that you know, get you through, uh, you know, the, the, the typical interview one-on-one -on -one type stuff. But then there are things that begin to now get you more to the technical aspect, of what technical skills do you have? And even in some cases we do um, not just talk to it, but actual uh, tests. Even for our uh, our IT administrative assistant, I don't know, I don't think other administrative assistants go through that particular process, but for an IT, there are certain things that we need you to be able to do. Um, so we have, um, we have a little set up where, you know, here's, here's our outcome, use Excel, I think it was something that they used to come up with these, and we're not just looking for an answer, uh, and that came up in our last IT initiative, you know, that, I was very pleased with that. You know, I think both the two individuals that we were looking at, they both got the right answer, but we were looking at their thought process. They're again looking at how you think. Uh, uh, so you, know, you can begin to, to do that as well. So it's not just did you get the right answer, but what is your thought process? How did you get it? Right in time. Is that correct? <laughs> I think, though, um, I just want to weigh in on the overarching diversity board uh, for the organization because I know we're all IT, but as it was said, this starts a lot higher. And we don't know our own biases. That's the most important. We don't know if we're biased because the person has red hair or if we're biased because the person is a little bit larger than we are. But those things have to start at the top and filter down. Because a lot of those changes that happen at a higher level, we don't have control over. Yeah, I would, I would just echo a little bit more of that. So at the school, we did um, this uh, test called the Implicit Bias Test, and it was very um, fruitful in what it, in what it, you know, showed what your biases were. And so I think a lot of times there are, you know, I don't want to get too, too, too far down into that, but a lot of times we do things unconsciously, right? It's, we were not necessarily conscious about some of the decision processes that we have, even our networks, if we look at our LinkedIn networks, you know, how diverse is our LinkedIn network? Because usually those are the networks that we pull when we're looking to hire people or we're thinking about job opportunities and that sort of thing. So 
But these are just things that happen unconsciously. There, there's no real mean intent behind it, but it's just how we associate. So uh, it was real interesting to kind of go through that implicit bias training. And I think for um, the school, it was an opportunity to first get hit with that initial shock of like, oh, I didn't realize I was that way, to now, okay, so now that I know that I have this thought process, so how do I reconcile that? You know, how do I deal with that? And, and, that, and that's, a, that's a pretty interesting place to be in. Um, so you really have to have, I think, some professionals come in and help your organization walk through that. I wouldn't just say you just get a somebody who likes diversity and just go through that because they have a bias as well, but you really want to get some professional organizations to kind of come in and help walk you through that. If you're talking about an overarching diversity group. So we have about five minutes left. So we'll take at least one more question from the floor if there's a question or comment. All right, so I'm going to give these guys. Yeah. Well, I was just going to add that I think um, adding to diversity, it really should start with the interview or before that. So we become very close partners with HR. Um, sometimes we invite them to the interview, sometimes we don't. We actually look through all the applications and we decide where they um, get filtered and so forth. We change the location of our interviews. We add people in from other departments, from the outside. I'll bring people from the outside in. We change the question. We don't always use the same question. So sometimes I'll invite other people from my department in different roles. So I think building some creativity with that, just the interview process, is a little bit to the start of building that diverse team as well. Yeah, I know. I know the. Uh, if you ever interview at the school of government, it's an all-day process um, because we typically have um, somebody from every classification within the. So we have a faculty member, an EPA, an SBA, administrative team, so forth and so on. So you walk you through this litany of of thought processes, and then you get the wonderful joy of presenting to the entire school. So it's it's a it's a very painful and tedious process, but you do get a, a complete sense of the organization as a whole because you're gonna at some point touch every aspect of the organization. And not only that, do you as the interviewee get a feel for every aspect of the organization, but then as those who are on the interview panel or hiring practice, you get all these different thought processes that you might not would have gotten if you just had the IT team there, that makes any sense. Yes, Paul. One thing to think about is, you know, Sometimes you have the luxury of building that diverse team from your hiring practices, but sometimes you take a job where you walk into a fully existing team, and that, that's when it's kind of on you as the leader to look at everything from doing Myers-Briggs personality type testing, trying to figure out what you have, how to assemble your groups in such a way that they're more high performing. So it, it, a lot of times it's hard when you walk in and there's no job openings, there's nothing to fill. You have to do it with the people that you have and then start figuring out your teams. And as Court said, it's a lot easier to do that if you have larger teams. If you have a small team, you know, it could be complicated. Heaven, heaven help you if you have to let somebody go that's not working out well, because that takes a year or two on average. But you know, it's a lot of work to do that as a leader coming into a new shop if you've got to figure all that out and try, try to use what tools you can to decide how to reorganize or put people in project teams. And a lot of times it's based on the project. So, some thoughts around that. One last thought that I want to leave the group with, or maybe a challenge might be about <coughs> is everyone in this room has some scope or level of authority. And it is very um, easy sometimes when um, back to the uncomfortableness, um, I would challenge each one of us, and it's intentional to not let that authority be a, a barrier to diversity uh, just because you can. Um, you know, and when you get to be your department head, obviously you have broader authority and it even is even that much more challenging. And whether that's in a hiring decision or a 
technical direction. Um, I would just challenge each one of us to be very mindful and judicious of how we use that authority, um, such that we're trying to uh, build consensus. And I guess my final thought would be, uh, well, two thoughts. Uh, one, I think it was, I have to look it up, but I think it was again Franklin that said, you know, you and I saw all those problems with the conversation, but we did not begin to solve any problems without first having a conversation. So I applaud you all for at least attending this particular event, having the foresight uh, to attend this particular event, uh, or this particular session, if you will, because uh, just being here, having an interest, no matter what the genesis behind our interest is, but just having that interest and saying, hey, you know, I, I want to learn a little bit more about diversity because I see the benefit. And, you know, I, I appreciate you all uh, uh, taking that first step, if you will, or maybe your second or third step. And I guess lastly, um, based on the conversation and based on the, uh, the uh, story that Kimberly shared with us, uh, I think, you know, it's very simple and we can't forget and say, hey, just be a Kimberly, you know, just be a Kimberly. Give, give, give somebody that shot when you think about it and you think about the burnt orange lady sitting to your right or left, then, you know, you can say, hey. Please remember, all members, to come down to Salon A, B, C. Outside, we are serving lunch currently, and we'll be moving in for the business luncheon in the next few minutes. Thank you. So that's it. Uh, <laughs> 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 <laughs>